fundamental research. So, before we start with the actual lecture today, let me give you an outline of how this, this mini course, uh, the school, will, will proceed. So, today, it's, it's a day of lectures, okay? You will have uh, two lectures in the morning with me. Okay, I didn't say my name. My name is Roberto Krenkel, okay? I'm, I'm one of the lecturers and one of the organizers. Marcelo Gomez is also a lecturer and organizer, and there's a third one, which is Renato Coutinho, which will be coming in the afternoon. And uh, so, how, how will this all of things uh, work out? So, first, today is lectures. I, I will give two lectures in the morning about basic introduction to mo modeling in, uh, in uh, 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 dynamics of infectious diseases. In the afternoon, there will be a lecture by Marcelo on more data in, in, uh, in public health and in epidemiology and uh, Renato about numerical methods. So, but starting tomorrow, we have only lectures in the morning, two lectures every day in the morning. And um, so, what you will be doing work on, on the rest of your time. So, there will be group works. So, you will be divided in, I guess, eight, eight groups uh, tomorrow. And each group will have a subject, a team. Okay? And uh, this subject will be of modeling some specific infectious disease uh, outbreaks or epidemics or uh, endemics or something like that. Okay? So, these projects are completely open-ended. This is not like a project like, do the first step is this one, the second step is this one. You will have to find the steps that you actually will uh, find interesting given a, a problem. Okay? It's not a mathematical problem that you will get. You will get a, a problem and that there have been cases or there is such and such situation. How can you use modeling approaches, whatever modeling kind, in order to give answers that have some, some that are meaningful for public health in this case. Okay? So this is the idea. One important point is you are a very interdisciplinary group. So there will be people that have full mathematical knowledge of many things, and there will be people that have less. Okay? Most of the time, the selection, I took, took I, I mean, I, I paid attention to, to if the person at least declares that he knows some math. Okay? So, and, um, so the groups will also be formed with, an, uh, with a perspective of having people from different areas together in the groups. Okay? So that you will have to learn to talk to people that don't have the same background as you. Uh, this is very important. Okay? So this is difficult. I mean, maybe it's the difficult, um, the most difficult thing in the, in the course, in the school, is that you have to talk and make uh, yourself understandable to people that have a completely different background. Okay. So, and uh, then um, we will have uh, three uh, 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 evening sessions, or six o'clock sessions. Tomorrow you will have a, uh, you will be asked to uh, uh, make a five minutes presentation about your, your subject. You will have your subject. Uh, at, uh, at the end of the morning, your group will, will uh, uh, meet, and uh, there will be indications where to do this meeting. And then uh, we will ask you just to five minutes saying, what's the subject? No solutions, only problem. Okay? Then on Thursday at, at 6, we will have questions and answers. You can question anything you want. And me, Marcelo, and Renato, and Guillaume Gu will arrive uh, uh, tomorrow. We will try to ask, answer any, any scientific questions you want. Yeah. And on Friday, 
we'll have a session of career advice. So this is just to, uh, for you to have an idea what you can do with what you are learning here and in terms of, of career, academic career or non-academic career, many possibilities. Okay? Then on Sunday, there will be the presentations. Okay? So you will have time to work. Uh, the idea is that you use your Saturday afternoon to prepare your presentations. This will be about 20 minutes presentations with some uh, time for questions. Okay. okay. So, we are therefore ready to start with the first lecture. So, before I start, let me ask you, if you do you have any questions? Any doubts? Any? Are you liking it or are you just... Uh, <laughs> so, one thing. All the lecturers here, they love questions. And we love so much questions that sometimes we pose the questions for you. Okay? So, but you should also pose questions to, to us. You can interrupt anytime. We have, we have um, the time slot for every lecture is one hour and 30. The idea is that we speak one hour and 20. And there will be 10 minutes for questions. But you can also interrupt. So this is no problem. Okay, and this is, is important. And sometimes you are just cutting completely. Sometimes, it, 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 and this is experience shows, sometimes you are not understanding one small thing, and this is obstructing you to understand the whole rest. So you just, sometimes it's a detail. Okay? So you can ask this. Okay? And as I told you, it's an interdisciplinary group. Not everybody has the same knowledge. So no problem asking even very elementary questions. Okay? So, so, in this first lecture, I will take my time, like half an hour, to give you a historical background on epidemics. Why? It's not a, it's not a school on history. But is, if you're a physicist, I would say you will understand that it's kind of not the phenomenology. Okay, it's, it's, you want, you're interested in modern infectious diseases, epidemics. So you have to have some idea about your subject. It's not just knowing the math, and then you don't know even which, which disease are you modeling. Okay? So the idea is that you have some, some ideas, about some knowledge about the, the subject of uh, uh, epidemic uh, about how epidemics were important in history and many details of how things uh, had uh, impact in society and so on. So this is our first, first point and then we will go for the introduction to real mathematical modeling of epidemics. So I will, in this uh, first part, just give you an outline about some uh, important epidemics that happened in the world. And we will start with the first one that has been documented, which is the plague of 18th. And then we will talk about the bubonic plague, or uh, black death, or no? then smallpox, cholera, and epidemic influenza from and uh, popularly known as uh, Spanish flu. And then there will be more, some more comments about present day challenges. Okay. So, the, 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 the plague of Athens was an epidemic that, that raged in, in, in 430 uh, uh, before current area. And, uh, and it was during a war between Athens and Sparta, the Peloponnesus uh, War. And the description, uh, is, uh, which you have here, uh, is from uh, one of the founders of history, which is Thucydides. Um, and he described uh, how this disease uh, uh, 
affected people. The heats in the head, heart cough, discharge of bile, of bile and spasm. And one third of the population died, including the famous ruler of Athens, Pericles. So, um, now, we don't have any idea what it was. What, what was this disease? Okay? So you have historical accounts, but then you have also uh, the possibility of uh, excavations and, and looking for uh, DNA traces in, in uh, old uh, uh, skeletons and uh, that you can find. So the current, the current uh, status is that this is probably a disease that was uh, um, uh, epidemic typhus, which is a bacterial disease, which is then transmitted by lice. Okay. So, one thing here is one third of the population died. And actually, there are people that did not get the disease. So, this is a kind of wild epidemic. There were no real ways of having any, any public health measures. It just came as, as something which is inevitable. So, pay, uh, uh, keep in your mind, not everybody was, was, uh, got sick. Uh, some people that didn't. Right? So let's keep this in mind. Okay? So, so this is one of the first uh, 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 accounts uh, of, of epidemics. Um, and then, well, I think this is probably the most uh, scaring disease that uh, humanity has, has uh, been uh, uh, subject to, which is the bubonic plague. Bubonic plague is, is, is an infectious disease that is caused by a, also by a bacterium, Yersinia pestis. This, uh, this disease has, there were three big pandemics of plague. Right? So, uh, it is, uh, if not treated, very high proportion of deaths. Today, we have antibi antibiotics for bacteria. So, it is a different situation than before antibiotics. Okay? So, uh, it can be in several kinds, pneumonic, bubonic, or septicemic. Doesn't uh, matter so much now for us. Yeah? And uh, this, this disease is, is a typical example which I, of very uh, big historical importance about uh, the way that people get sick. So let us go back like 200 years before Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, people didn't know what actually infectious diseases were. What, it, they, what caused the disease? A person got sick, so what is this causing it? So this is a debate of over centuries, and how do you get infected? And there have been two big currents now, one is the contagion. The current is a contagionism. It says that you get sick because you somehow are in contact with the other sick person. Right? This was well accepted for sexually transmitted, transmitted diseases, because in this case, that was pretty much clear. But it was not accepted for other diseases, like the bubonic plague. Why? Because bubonic plague is transmitted through vectors. Vectors in the, in the language of epidemiology are uh, intermediate hosts. Okay? So you have, you, get, you have the 
the r certain kind of rat that can be infected, and then there is the flea of the rat that can infect you. Right? So this means that it, but this is, has been discovered at the end of the 19th century, this, this root. Okay? This is very recent result. So people didn't know what diseases were. You got here, guy. I have bubonic plague. I don't have contact with anybody else. But somebody over there also gets it. How could it be contagious? So this was, this was a problem for the contagionist uh, 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 tendency in the, in, the, in the scientific discussion, but it was difficult to explain this. But it only becomes a, a plausible uh, explanation once you know that diseases are caused by what people at the time of the 19th century called microbes or germs or, as some other authors put it, small animals, some, some small living beings that you cannot see and then you get infected through them. Okay? So if you tell this to somebody in, in uh, say, 820, uh, they say they're completely, you are completely crazy. Where are you, where you are postulating some animals or some live being that you cannot see and with this you give an answer. It would be much more reasonable at, at that time that it was just something that got through the air, with some property of the air, which actually was a, at the end always some kind of poisoning. So this is an, an example that, that shows that, uh, that we, we should not take for granted, that some, we not, should, should not think that people in the 17th, 16th century were, were just morons. They didn't understand things. It was really difficult until you, you come to the point that there are microbes and then with, with Pasteur and with Koch you can find them and show that they are the agents of, of uh, uh, an infection. So, oops, I went back. So, there were three pandemics of plague. So, one is uh, not well documented. It's the plague of uh, Justinian in um, 541 current area. Then there was the Black Death, which was in the 14th century in Europe. It entered through uh, Sicily and killed one third of the population of, of Europe. Okay, so, and uh, then there was a third pandemic which uh, began in, in China, killed 12 uh, million people in, in China and India and, and South um, Eastern Asia, okay? and uh, with some overspill to other regions. Okay? But uh, so it was only in the third pandemic that uh, uh, a French scientist, Paul Louis Simon, uh, working in India and in Vietnam came out with an explanation for the, for the way you get infected. So he made an, an experiment, I won't go through all the experiment here, but an experiment to show that actually it's the flea of a certain mouse that transmits the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Right? And this is at the very end of 19th century, here you see, in in 1898. So it is quite recent, actually. Yeah. Well, okay. So there's still plague today. And uh, it can be treated with an antibiotics if antibiotics are given timely. Right? So this is plague in Brazil. So the last case. I think here can, can, uh, it, it, it's actually practically extinct okay, since 2005. So, but, well, okay, it's practically, you know, sometimes you have one case, okay? I think this means something. The pathogen is circulating, okay? 
So, uh, and this is uh, the uh, reported number of cases of plague uh, over this uh, 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 time span here, these five years. You see that uh, there have been several places where you had some cases okay, of plague. You can see that uh, the biggest uh, problems was in Madagascar and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, this is Tanzania, I think, or Zimbabwe, I can't remember. And there were some cases in, in Peru and in US, and US and China and Russia. So this is these cases here are connected to the typically disease of poverty. Okay? And uh, people that don't get, and, and there are some death, and the people don't get anti antibiotics uh, early enough or uh, don't have any medical uh, uh, infrastructure to treat them and so on. And, but n not only, but because you see, it's also present in the US. So in the US and in, uh, in this uh, Asiatic um, uh, part, this is connected to usually to rural areas and desertic areas. So that's kind of Arizona, New Mexico places, where you still have some cases of plague. But death is very unfrequent because well, the United States is a, right, a rich country and has a lot of antibiotics that actually do a good job against plague. Yeah. So now one of the most important epidemics that we had in the world was the epidemics, which, which was uh, the high season of this epidemic, let's say, was in the uh, 18th century. Okay? And it's the smallpox. Okay? Um, and smallpox is, uh, is a viral disease. And it is very uh, uh, easily transmitted. It is uh, by contact with uh, people, but bodily fluids, but also it can be transmitted to fomites, what people call fomites, which are objects where the virus survives for some time. Okay? And so the case fatality rate, so if you have a case, okay, what's the number of What's the percentage of people that will die? So it's 30% super high. This is super, super high. Okay. So, and the survivors had, uh, were marked mainly in the, in the face by, by scars. Okay. And smallpox gives us the opportunity to mention this uh, English doctor. Uh, Edward um, uh, 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 Jenner. So he was the first person to perform to to to, to, to discover a vaccine. Okay. So before him, there was also a, there was an idea of inoculation of of pathogens in order to create immunity and so on. But what he discovered was was curious because he actually knew, and he was in, 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 in a region where there were farms and so on, he knew that people that, uh, that uh, worked with cows never got smallpox. And actually cows have a disease which is due to a, a, um, due to a, a different virus, but the same family, which is called cowpox, which has only mild effects on, on people. But there's cross immunity. If you have cowpox, you don't get smallpox. And this is the idea of the vaccine. You inoculate the cowpox uh, virus into people, and they get immune to smallpox. Okay? So this is the, is the, at the end of the 18th century, this is the discovery of 
Edward Jenner. Uh, and uh, the experiments he made were ob would obviously be completely for forbidden today. Okay? He just went on to inoculate a boy of eight years old boy. It was the son of a gardener. And then he exposed, some time later, exposed the boy to smallpox. Uh, hopefully it worked, but <laughs> okay. So, um, smallpox is also the only case of an infectious disease that has been eradicated. There is no more smallpox in the world until 1980, more or less people got vaccinated against smallpox. I got, because I'm old. But probably most of you not. So the idea was smallpox has no animal reservoir. It, it, and it also has no environmental reservoir. So it's only in humans. If you have zero cases over an extended period of time, you can make sure there is no circulation. Right? Because there is no reservoir. And this makes smallpox different from the rest. So if there's no reservoir, you can eradicate it. It's the only disease that we have eradicated in the whole story of humanity. And then, at 1980, after eradication was clear, people did not get any more vaccinated. Why? Because if you don't have the circulation of the pathogen, and you vaccinate people, you only have the side effects of the vaccines, which may be not many, but it has only side effects. It's, it's bad. So this is, means that population that was born after 1980 is susceptible to smallpox in general. But there's no circulation. You could ask. Does anybody have some, some reserve of, of, of some, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some virus and so on? Yes, you know, American and Russians have, right? in highly protected laboratories and so on. There's, this is the kind of thing that people have a lot of... Uh, uh, that people that are afraid of uh, this could, in some distant future, uh, be subject to bioterrorism uh, threats and so on. So, uh, here we just illustrate the smallpox deaths as a share of all deaths in London. Okay, so why London? Because people just had a good public health service and they, they, they notified everything and so on. You see that really that it was, there's a as a drop here, and this is already with the very first vaccine of, of uh, based on cowpox, and then obviously you have some more uh, uh, developed vaccines, and there's a lot of things, and uh, which led to eradications. Here, here we stopped at uh, 1902. That took till still 75 years to eradicate. Right? So the ne our next, uh, next monster is cholera. Cholera was considered the, uh, 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 is considered as, as the main disease of the 19th century. So cholera is transmitted. Well, it's, it's, it's a di you have diarrhea, and uh, it is it's a very frightening disease. Frightening why? Because this disease can kill you in some hours. Because people get infected, it's, it's, it's a bacterium, it's called Vibro cholerae, and uh, this, uh, most cases are non-symptomatic, non right? but if you get symptomatic, and uh, you, get, you lose uh, fluids, you lose plasma of your, of, your, of your blood, to such an extent that you even have your blood becoming denser and denser, which gives you cramps, and then you get all your muscles cramped, and then your heart, you have a heart attack. So when this could 
has a, it, ha, it has an onset, which is like uh, I'm here talking and I say I'm not feeling well, and six hours later I'm dead. So it was really something very frightening. And so it has been discovered by Robert Koch that uh, that the etiological agent is uh, Weber cholerae. This was discovered at the uh, 1880s. And um, seven successive pandemics have swept the world. So this is very tragic uh, disease. But uh, here goes the story that uh, many people maybe already know. It's in the middle of the 19th century, but it's still before the acceptance of the theories of, of Pasteur and Koch about the germ theory of diseases. There was this fellow, uh, it's an uh, English uh, physician, uh, John Snow, that proposed that cholera was transmitted by water. Yeah. So, why? Well, there's the whole story that he actually, he, he lived in London, and uh, there were several clusters of cases, and he could find a correlation between clusters and a certain water pumps in the city. And at a certain point, he convinced authorities to close one of the, water, of one of the pumps, the, the one that's still there. Okay? And cholera decayed in this population. So, okay, so it could be something to do with the water. So he postulated that there were some small animals, <laughs> living beings that probably uh, uh, cause cholera. And this was completely, I mean, people, it, it, many people, important people, think that this was ridiculous. Because there was no theory of, of microbes. So he's postulating the existence of something I cannot show. And he, so, in modern terms, we would say he could show correlation, but he could not show causation. Right? So it took a time, and uh, uh, kind of 40 years until cholera was definitely uh, discovered to be caused by a bacterium and that the main root is the oral fecal root of contamination, contaminated water. Right? And um, so this, but this is uh, it much later that uh, this has been established. But this has been, uh, has an important uh, impact, because it means that you already had the story about bubonic plague, and now you have this story. Also, means means you better don't be in touch with dirty things. Your water should be treated. Your house doesn't should not have fleas and so on. So this will. This gave rise to the hygienist movement in, in public health, which has very strong impact. And the kind of cities and houses that we have here now are in very much influenced by, by this movement. Okay? There have been some, some people that... Uh, that try to transfer hygienism to discuss political and social, social, uh, social issues. And this has been connected to very right-wing people and so on, that uh, making the society clean and so on. But in the context of, the, of public health, it has been very important and has actually led to a uh, decrease in, in, in many uh, infectious diseases. Okay? Uh, there is still cholera in the world. What happened is that uh, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, so the beginning of the 20th century, a, a new, it's, it's a biotype, but this is a, a new kind of cholera, okay, let's say uh, easily, uh, which is much milder as a disease, and uh, it's transmittable, but it's milder. And uh, this kind of 
took over the other, the first cholera uh, strain. It's a new strain, and it is uh, much less virulent. And uh, you see, the diseases are uh, severe diseases. Only two percent of the case. So this, as it is less virulent, and people do not so much die of it, and that. Uh, but it, it, it got around easily. So there's still uh, so cholera. It is connected to the fecal ochre uh, or, um, uh, or a root, but also this new El Tor uh, uh, strain. This uh, one survives longer. So if, for instance, a, a seabird or a fish consumes water, which has the pathogen, that can be survive for certain time and then can be transmitted to human beings. For instance, by by consuming raw meat. Okay. So, uh, in cholera nowadays, clearly a disease of poverty. It's connected to bad sanitation and so on. Here are the some details uh, from. From this uh, time span here, there are still cases of cholera. You have even important cases here. This here is, is uh, a very important epidemic in Peru. You have a background connected to African counters, which is never goes to zero and stays there. And this is uh, usually in, in Mozambique and in um, Zambia and uh, and Zimbabwe and uh, Congo, so you have this kind of uh, epidemic. And uh, here, th these cases, uh, here, these cases, very important cases which happened in, uh, in 2010, connected to the earthquake in Haiti, and cholera became endemic in Haiti. There was no cholera, and then with the destruction of the whole infrastructure, introduction of cholera. Okay. So, and these cases here, these peaks here, are connected to a, a raging cholera epidemic in Yemen. It's very localized. So, then, just to mention, the Spanish flu, which is uh, actually influenza kind, uh, was also a very important pandemic. It swept the world and it killed, uh, it, it infected like one third of the population of the world and killed millions. And, uh, and this is a direct transmitted disease by a, by a virus. Right? And actually in Sao Paulo, the first death occurred in October 21. But at the end of November, it was extinct. So this is also something that you have to pay attention. There was no vaccine. There wasn't anything you could do. I mean, you could just isolate people, quarantine, and so on. But no real measure, public health measures, that could contain the epidemic. And uh, it lasted um, kind of one month. So it went away. It's the same way it arrived. It went away. So let's... Think about this is a pattern that we want to explain with our models, that, that not everybody is infected, and that there can be something called the burnout of the, uh, of, of the epidemic. Okay? So that's for the history of these uh, this, uh, monsters. And uh, nowadays, uh, well, yes, this, is, this is just to show you in the US, in the 20th centuries, that that's the uh, the the um, um, mortality associated with infectious diseases it's it's uh, clearly decaying and this is not only in the United States I just have only this plot uh, but anyhow and uh, this has to do with with all the hygiene and the discovery of antibiotics and um, advances of science and in general okay? there's a small increase at the end of the curve. And this is an important case. 
So by the end of the 70s, there was a general sensation, and people spoke about that and wrote about that, that the case of infectious diseases can, will be closed. We, will, as we could eradicate uh, smallpox. Let's go for the next one. The next one would be poliomyelitis, right? which has not been eradicated. That there are reasons, but OK, we can discuss this other time. And the idea was infectious diseases were not anymore so important. And actually, if you look at the main causes of death in the world, if you take in the world, there's only one infectious disease. Well, well, maybe now with COVID-19, that could be in the 10 most important uh, um, causes of death. But usually, before COVID-19, there was only malaria. But if you look for the rich world, malaria disappears. And there was no infectious disease at all. The beginning of, of the 20th century, there was, for instance, uh, there was influenza, but there was also tuberculosis and uh, as infectious diseases. So, so there was the sensation that, OK, we, we are winning this battle. There was optimism. And then what happens? In the 80s? Hmm? HIV AIDS. But this was this was like uh, 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 in conceptually of it's, 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 it's a it's a very important disease. But conceptually, this also changed the conceptual landscape, saying, okay, it is there. There is something now that we will call emerging diseases. So this is, was an emergence. It's a new disease. We didn't know it. It didn't come from anywhere. Okay? For instance, cholera was endemic for a long time in, the, in some region of uh, India, in the Ganges uh, uh, region. And then through movement, movementations connected to the British Empire and so on, it just got uh, to swept the world. So with HIV eyes, it's, it's, it's emerging. So out of nowhere comes something, right? So this is this this introduced this new concept, and and uh, the optimism of the 70s uh, could not follow into the 80s. Um, so and then obviously uh, everybody is still impacted, and there was COVID-19, and I don't think I have to talk a lot about COVID-19. Everybody knows, but this is also a kind of. Emerging diseases, it's influenza, but there's a strain. And uh, uh, actually, before the COVID-19, there had been already people arguing that uh, uh, a disease like influenza transmitted by respiratory means and so on, if there was a highly pathogenic case, that would be very, very dangerous for, for, for the human population. And actually, that happened. And this now calls for research on being prepared for the next one, because the, we were not prepared. I mean, we thought we were prepared because there was the first, uh, 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 the COVID, uh, the, the, the SARS in Hong Kong before, and uh, that could be contained. But that was, uh, uh, there was part of it was really a good work, but also look. And uh, this one could not be contained and went worldwide. So how should we be prepared for this kind of thing? And then to end this story, this story, what is also of big concern today is something else. It's not the emerging, it's the re-emerging. So things that we thought that are controlled like missiles, which, which has never been eradicated, it's not that the case, but very low levels, there is a vaccine, and this is, is not any more seen in most cases, well, not any more seen as something very, very uh, 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 dangerous, okay? But then you have the reemergence of, of missiles due to anti-vax uh, and uh, low vaccination co uh, coverage, which can be due to people that don't want to get the vaccine, 
but also can be due to non-availability of vaccines in certain regions of the world. Okay, so that's it for the history. So anyone has a comment about, uh, have I forgotten some, some, some monster here? Or have you? Uh, okay, so let's go for the modeling session. We will start with simple model. And in this uh, end of this uh, class here, I want really to go step by step so that with a simple model, you know exactly what is being assumed in your model. So, our modeling uh, strategy will be the classical one, which consists, so we will model uh, infectious disease at the populational level, okay, at the level of the population. So we will divide a given population, the focal population, into classes. So every individual will have a kind of state, and the state could be the person is susceptible, so has no immunity and can acquire the, the disease. The post person can be infectious, and in the first of our models, we will assume that a person that has been infected is also infectious. But you could also split between infective, but not infectious, and so on. Okay? So there can be many variants. And then you have people that are immune. Okay? Why are they immune? Well, because they had a disease, for instance, or there's vaccination in your population. Okay? So we will we'll use this. This, uh, it's called compartmental, compartmental models. And we will divide the population in compartments. So one compartment will be the susceptibles. And in our first model, which is the, uh, one of the simplest models you can uh, think, you <laughs> can get infected and go from susceptible to infected cases. So you usually you, you, you point with a dotted line here, so saying that susceptible becomes infectious due to the contact with infectious. Okay? And then I will suppose here that this is a disease that gives you no immunity. And once you recover from the disease, you go back to the susceptible case. Plus. Okay. So, let me see your intuition. What kind of disease could this be? Have you any idea? It's not an easy question, but you can take your chance and uh, just uh, try. The common flu. The common flu is a little bit more complicated because common flu is a highly mutating thing. So you get Im actually immune to this actual strain, but not for the next year strain. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, more ideas. So use your imagination. Hmm? I didn't understand you. Dengue. Dengue. It's not the case because when once you get infected by a serotype, you get in immune for the serotype. You don't get immune for the next, for the other serotypes. Th there's a period of cross immunity, and then you lose the cross immunity. So, dengue is actually four, four diseases, and you get immune to the one that you had. Um, so, hmm? Coronavirus. So, it's not exactly that. Coronavirus, you get immune, but you're immune, in, but you lose your, your immunity later. So this would be you'd go to something immune here, and then go back to susceptible, not directly. So they have a period of immunity. So it's called waning immunity. Hmm? Malaria. You can get infected several times by malaria. You are right. Okay. Yeah. Didn't think about malaria, but it's true. You can get several times. And 
But after many times, you get actually immune from malaria. Also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's that, that's true. That that's tr that's true. But then uh, there are also some people that. Hmm? Yeah, there's also surgeons of malaria. It's a complex uh, thing. It's not. Um, so the, uh, okay, let me give you the answer. But uh, you, I think you wouldn't guess this. So the typical uh, uh, cases that are well modeled by this is gonorrhea. Okay, gonorrhea, or uh, uh, chlamydia. Also, it's bacterial, and uh, they, you don't create, you don't have immunity. Okay. So this is really you. You get, you, I mean, you get uh, cured. I mean, you don't have any more disease, but you are immediately susceptible. It's different from losing your immunity. Okay. So, and the, the mathematical way of describing this, we are interested, and in, you can see that the name of the school is dynamics of infectious diseases epidemics. Okay. Dynamics mean, what, means what? How these classes of susceptible and infected people change in time. Therefore, for instance, if you have a whole completely susceptible population, in this ma the mathematical description of an epidemic will be the number of infected people increases and the number of susceptible people decreases. And so you have this change in time of the number of individuals in the class S and the class I. We will further make the assumption that the population is constant. Then you say, but people die. Yeah? So, but this is a problem of time scales. On the, 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 the change in the number of the population, the number of individuals in a population, is usually over a scale of years. And epidemics, sometimes, most of them, are in the scale of months or one year. So effectively, from the epidemic point of view, the population can be taken constant. Okay. So, so that you don't have to care about the demographic effects at that point. So you want to write it. So S will be a function of time. I will be a function of time. So S is the susceptibles, and this is the infected. Okay. Uh, then you will write some derivative of S in time, so the time change of S, and something for the time change of T, of I. Okay? So, first thing. So, variation of the number of susceptibles. So, the number of susceptibles will decrease due to infection. Okay? It can increase due to people going back here, but we'll see this later. The first, the decrease of the number of susceptible is due to the contact with infected people. Okay? So somehow this guy here should be, let us put this, a per proportional. Okay? So something like, well, it has to be proportional first to the number of infected. So that if I don't have any, if I is zero, no infected, then there's no infection, and you are in a, in a disease-free state. Yeah? So now, I'm saying that it's linearly pro it is, it's proportional. Could, could be different, could be. I'm, I'm, I'm actually here, I'm, I'm postulating that there's no interference between infectious people. Yeah? But then this has to be multiplied. Something, the number of contacts and the probability of infection. More or less. More contacts, if people have more contacts, you have more new infected. And that so should also depend on given a contact. It will actually infect people because it's not that you have a susceptible and an infected, and hundred percent of time the person gets infected. No, there's a probability of infection. Okay? So this thing here 
should be something like this. Let's say, so it is proportional, and moreover, it has to be negative because it will decrease, S will decrease, or you need a negative sign here. So sometime, let's say this is the number of contacts. So then you could argue that people don't have the same number of contacts. Right? There are people that have many contacts and people that have less contacts. This can be taken into account, but we won't do it at this point. So we will take a kind of average number of contacts in the population. Okay? So, um, then given a contact, so this is some, some k parameter, you have to see what's the probability that the infected person has a contact, what's the probability that the other one is susceptible? Because if the other one is infected, there's no new infection. So the probability will be assumed to be just the proportion of susceptibles in the whole population, where the whole population is of size n, which is equal to s plus i. Okay? So k times s to the times plus, so you have a contact, you have the probability that the other person has, is susceptible, and then you have to look for the probability of actually infecting, given a possible infective contact. Okay? So, now, very nice. Now, we are almost coming to the first term of our equation, but let us look at this guy. Now, there are two possibilities now. Will the number of contacts depend on the total size of the population or not? And this is a matter of debate. So, let me give an example, which is a textbook example, when you expect that the number of contacts does not depend on the size of the population. Sexually transmitted diseases. The number of sexual partners a person has in Sao Paulo or in Campinas or, I don't know, in Buenos Aires, which have different sizes of population, is not very much affected by the size of the population of the city. So you expect this to be k be kind of constant, which is average number of sexual partners or sexual contacts that the that, um, average person has. So in this case, this is the first uh, possibility. It's just called k is given by the standard uh, incidence, which is k is equal to constant. It's just a constant. But then there's also something called the uh, let me put it here, the mass action incidence, where you say that k is equal to some proportional uh, con constant, a is a proportionality constant, but it depends on n. The larger the population, the higher the incidence. The high number of contacts is larger when you have a larger population. So. This is a matter of debate, because you could th think, okay, if I live in a, say now respiratory diseases, direct contact, maybe in large cities, people more frequently will use public transport, which may be overcrowded, and there's more possibility of contact, so that comparing a small city with a big one could be in, in principle, possible to, to have a dependence on the size. However, that can be also contradicted if you look for the most recent example of, of respiratory disease, which is COVID-19. So COVID-19, if you look, let's say, Sao Paulo, it's more than 10 million people. It looks for Campinas with 1 million people, which is a city nearby here. So the characteristics of the, of the epidemics are not very different. 
You have the waves of the epidemics, the, the duration of the epidemics, and so on. It's just that the scale, the number of people. So the proportion of people that get infected, and the proportion uh, of, uh, uh, of people that get infected and then recovered, it seems not to depend on the size, or not very strongly on the size. So this is a case that there can be debate, but surely it's not just linear here. Maybe there's a dependence on N, but not so strong. Where this incidence is more relevant is for infections in animals, in, in, zoono uh, in zoonosis. So, when I say that I use the standard in in incidence, I'm taking into account the social structure of our contacts. So, if you live here on a smaller city, the social contacts, not necessarily uh, a sexual, but the contacts you have, you have your family, your friends, and so on, doesn't depend so much on the size of the city. Right? So, uh, this is, but this is due to what we have a social structure. Right? So, most of the animals, except for ones that have social structures, but most of them don't have a social structure. And then you have this case of uh, people, for instance, farming, farming salmon or farming cattle and so on. So you, you cram people, people not, in animals, together, and they will, just because there's a larger poor, uh, number of, of individuals, they have more contacts. So in, in, for pathogens, in the case of, of, uh, of uh, uh, some zoonosis, that could be the case here. Also had been dis, uh, discussed could be the case with pathogens of plants. Okay. So, for our next classes and from now on, I will consider the standard incidence. Right? It's not difficult to change from the standard uh, incidence to the mass action incidence. You just take the k that you had before and you say it's now it's alpha n. Okay? So, you can go from one to the other. Okay? When it is important, it is important that uh, the, the, these differences get maybe important if you want to compare uh, uh, epidemics in different places, which have different ends, different populations. Okay? So, with all this, we will stay with this guy here. And then there's this probability. <sighs> this probability. How do you know this probability of having given a susceptible and an effective uh, person that meet, what's the probability that the person actually will be infected? Ha in have you any guess how to know this? I want guesses. I have 20 minutes for your guesses. So, I'm saying that the number of susceptibles should, what should uh, uh, depend, the, the variation of number of susceptibles should depend on the number of effective people times the number of contacts times the number of uh, the proportion of susceptibles in the population times the probability that given a susceptible and an infected that have a contact, they actually will create a new infection. But it's not every contact that creates a new infection. So, here, K could be, in principle, thought to be it's a characteristic of the population. There's a certain average number of contacts in between people. S over N is a variable of the system already, but P is a parameter for this equation that we will write. This parameter, uh, can, it, can you measure this? Yeah, no, this is, n okay. So, okay, you already gave the answer. So, this guy is unknown, except for some cases that people have tried to get this guy for sexually transmitted diseases. 
but in very, very specific cases, because, you know, data about sexual transmitted cases are very difficult because people just lie about their sexual life. And, uh, but you can say, okay, I don't know this guy. And then I might, I, I, I want, I will look for this model and I will look for data and see which is the value of this guy that actually describes that data. This is called data fitting. And you will have a class of an article to you about data fitting. You give a model, and then you have an unknown parameter, and then you see how, how to fit this to data. Okay? So this is not our subject here, but just let me mention this. In every uh, uh, modeling uh, approach where you really want models to describe actual data that you have, this guy will be a fitting parameter. Yeah. So for now on, I will just call k times p as beta. Okay? It's the usual notation, which takes us here to this guy being minus beta i times s over n. So this is the first term in our equation. Okay? So, And we start already with uh, with um, a term which is i times s. Both are variables, so it's a nonlinear term in the equation. Okay, it's nonlinear. Okay, now. Just to, uh, just to mention, this here has a consequence, but, um, okay, I, I will talk about this, this later. Okay, so first thing, what happened to these guys here? So all of them become infective, infective or infectious, which is the same in our case. So these guys will appear here, but with a plus sign, okay? They leave this compartment and go to this one, so you will have a beta i, s over n, okay? All of them that get infectious, by definition, go to the infectious uh, class. Now, now, we have to model this, this uh, uh, part of the... We have to model how i leave the people, leave the infective class and go to the susceptible class, okay? So, this is usually done in the following way. So, after being infectious, individuals go back to S, and the usual assumption is that a certain fraction of I becomes S, Per unit time, a certain constant fraction of s of i population becomes s, which says that dittt increases due to the inflow of the here and decreases with some parameter gamma times i. So if you look at this in this way, di dt of one over i is equal to gamma. So this is the number of infective um, um, uh, uh, number of infective uh, uh, individuals that is leaving the, the, the compartment per unit time per capita, and you say this is a constant. So the, the certain fraction, say 10 percent per unit time, 20 percent per unit time. That's it. That's the assumption that this is a constant. Okay. So, can we elaborate more on that? Yes, we can always elaborate more on that. So, in order to elaborate on that, we will do the following reason. Let us consider that at a given moment, we will take a certain, certain the individuals of a certain population that at that moment got infected. I will call this a cohort of infective uh, uh, individuals that got infected at a certain 
uh, time that I will use a different letter, which is yes, at s equal to zero, I have a certain number of infective people, a certain cohort, and I want now to follow this cohort of people. Okay? So it has, you have a certain number, I would call this number u of zero, and uh, you will see why. And let u of s, by, I'm not using the time t because now I say at s equal to zero, it, it's this time that people got infected. And for s flowing, uh, uh, for increasing s, you will have the uh, number of people that still is in the class. Okay? So s is the time since infection. So it's a special time. It's the time since infection. So u of s is b. Uh, uh, will be the number of individuals remaining infective after f steps of time, after steps of time. But now we know that people leave the infective class with a certain constant rate, which is given by this gamma. Therefore, u, the derivative, I will use this for, for the derivative of du des, is equal to minus gamma u, all of s, okay? Well, so, which gives you u is given by an exponential, okay, u is now this so you have a certain number of your cohort and then it will decrease because we are only considering decrease, will decrease and I say u of s is the number of individuals that are still infected after, say, one hour or one day. Then I want to know the fraction of individuals that has exactly s in period of infectivity. So we want to know the fraction of individuals that has S infectivity period. So this is not U, okay? This is not U. U gives you the number of people that are still infected, okay? And now I want to know the number of people that actually got infected until time S but then the next time they are not anymore. Okay? So this is what you can look here s times u of s. This is something that decays exponentially. Okay, that, that's here. And well, the fraction of people that if you look here, the fraction of people that have exactly infectivity equal to some point s is the people that u of s minus the people that went out. Okay? So this will be, so the fraction will be 1 over u0, which is the total population, us minus us at an infinitesimal step away from s. Okay? And this is obviously 1 over u of 0. And then there's a minus here. 1 times gu ds times ds. So this is the number of, to be rephrase it better, it's the number of people that have infectivity period to s, between s and s plus ds. Okay? So now, I want to calculate the mean infectivity period. Okay? The mean infectivity period. So 
This is the people that have period uh, uh, between S and S plus DS. So the mean infectivity period will be just the average 1 over u0 of integral from 0 to infinity of this guy, s times du ds ds. Okay? So this is the number of people with period s, exactly s, multiplied by s. So you are, you are taking the, infecti the mean infectivity period, but you have to say, so you have a guy that has one day, you have five guys with one day, so this five times one day. Plus, then I have ten guys that have two days. Plus, ten times two days. Then plus, certain number that have three days of infinity period times the number of times three. So this is, this is the one, two, three, in the discrete case, and this is the number of infectivity, individuals that have the infectivity S. So now, knowing that you, you can calculate this here. And actually, it's not difficult to calculate. So you, if you want, it, it's, it's a uh, integration by parts and so on. Uh, this is, so if man minus 1 over u0 with s times u of s calculated between in in zero in infinity plus one over u zero integral from zero to infinity of u s g s. So, if you are not very mathematical minded, okay, so you just have to close your eyes for this uh, small thing, and then you, you get the result. Okay, so if, uh, this is zero, okay, because s at zero, s is zero, and at infinity. Uh, this decays exponentially, uh, then this goes also to zero. So this is zero. And this guy here, which it's the remaining thing, will give you 1 over u of zero. So now you know this guy. It is, it is uh, the exponential. What did I, I did write the exponential in some way? Ah, okay, here. Here. Okay, so you use this and now you can do the integration, which will give you 1 over u zero. Uh, times u of 0 divided by gamma e to minus gamma s between infinity and 0. So this is just the integral of e to minus gamma s. This cancels, and this gives you uh, this one at infinity is 0. Okay, there was some minus guy. There was a minus missing. Sorry. And that this was and then this gives you, at infinity, this is 0. And at 0, it is 1. This gives you just 1 over gamma. So this mysterious constant here is the mean infectivity. Guess what? That we can actually calculate from medical data. This is nice, because now you have something anymore in a mysterious constant. It is the mean infectivity time. So if you have a certain disease that has, OK, you could say that maybe this, this does not depend only on the mean of the infectivity time, but at a first approximation that this is a, 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 the idea. So the mean infectivity time is something that you know. I mean, if I tell you COVID-19, then they will say, OK, it's like 10 days. It's not one year, not one day. Okay? So you have an idea, at least, of the, the, uh, the order of magnitude of this, of this constant. Okay? Well, this is really very nice. So what also this means is that the infectivity time which is this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this guy here, DUGS, it is, uh, is something which is e to minus gamma s also. 
the derivative of the exponential itself, which means that the infectivity times is distributed like an exponential. Okay? Then you could say, OK, but I know diseases where this is not true. Okay? Yeah, you can do better. And that would take us to integral differential equation, which I don't think you want to know now. Okay? So now, to complete our equation that we will discuss uh, after the, uh, the coffee break, we come here, let me put it in full glory. You have the first one, so you have ds dt is equal to minus beta i over n. Di dt is beta si over n minus gamma times i. And this guy leave this compartment and go to this one, all of them. Okay. And this is the system of two ordinary differential equations that we will study in, in half an hour. Okay? So this is the first model that we wrote. This is the SI. People call it SIS model sometimes, because it's goes back to S. It has two equations. It has a nice property that if you sum up this right-hand side and the left-hand side, this here gives cancel here and cancel here. This is 0, means that the derivative of S plus I is equal to constant, which is S plus I is equal to the total population. OK. So. Any questions about that? Uh, okay. So as you see, I, I took more time than any usually uh, people do in discussing things, because I think it's important that you know the assumptions about the standard incidence and the meaning of gamma and the assumptions that are behind this, uh, this particular form of equations. Okay? Now, the equations will be simple to solve, and we will of the of results about that okay so it's time for coffee break and uh, so ah before this you could ask uh, bibliography okay so there's some nice text uh, and uh, i brought uh, there are two that you can take a look which is modeling infectious disease in human and animals which is a book uh, uh, written by uh, uh, keeling and rohani which is kind of textbook uh, it's, um, and there's a more recent one, which is much more mathematical. Okay, if you are, that's for mathematically minded people, which is Mathematical Models in Epidemiology by Fred Brower, Castillo Javis, and Zhang Feng. Okay. So can I take a look here and, uh, and uh, see, or take a photo and look for it in somewhere? Okay. okay, half an hour, coffee break.